Hi everyone, welcome Webinar Wednesdays. What about the food? How food can help or harm your eczema. I'm Carrie Gautier, Director of Marketing Communications here at the National Eczema Association. While we wait for people to log on, I want to share a few of our upcoming events with you. In July 2019, you can look forward to our Eczema Expo. We are headed to Scottsdale, Arizona and the beautiful Ganey Ranch Resort on July 18th through 21st. We hope you will join us. You can apply for scholarships and begin fundraising to attend now, and we anticipate registration will be open in early 2019, so keep your eyes out for that. Since you're here with us this evening, I presume you enjoy the webinar series, and we will be starting a little refresh next year, so keep your eyes on our email and social media for that announcement for what will be happening with the webinars in 2019. And of course, because it is the season of giving, this is a reminder that any donation, $25 or above, will receive the benefit of our quarterly magazine delivered for a year. Well worth it. Well, it looks like most people have logged in, so we'll go ahead and get started. Again, for those just joined us, I'm Carrie Gautier, Director of Marketing and Communications here at the National Eczema Association. And this webinar is What About the Food? How Food Can Help or Harm Your Eczema. The National Eczema Association is a patient-oriented organization. It was founded in 1988 to improve the health and quality of life of individuals with eczema through research, support, and education. We are run by a volunteer board of patients and doctors who give their time and expertise, as well as a scientific advisory committee who lend their expert opinions and experience to everything that we do. <clears throat> I want to thank our sponsor for the 2019 series of webinars, Sanofi Genzyme Regeneron. Webinar control content is, of course, controlled by Nia, but we couldn't do it without our partners at Sanofi Genzyme Rege Regeneron. This evening's presentation is presented by Dr. Ruchi Gupta. Dr. Gupta is an associate professor of pediatrics and medicine at Northwestern, <coughs> at Northwestern Medicine. She's the director of science and outcomes of allergies and asthma research team, the SOAR program and a clinical attending at the Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. Most importantly here, she is nationally recognized for her groundbreaking research in the areas of food allergy and asthma epidemiology, specifically her research on childhood food allergy prevalence, which as most of us know is very closely tied to eczema. And with that, I am going to go ahead and pass this to Dr. Gupta. Perfect. Um, so happy to be here to, to speak to all of you. I'm really excited to work with Nia. Um, it's an amazing organization and one that's very needed. So happy to add my, um, my little bit of research and information um, to all the wonderful things you do. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, food. So I am a researcher and a pediatrician here at Lurie Children's and at Northwestern. Uh, I do a lot of research in food allergy and asthma um, and eczema. Uh, and I personally have uh, two children who were severely affected with eczema. And then one of my two went on to develop food allergies and the other one just environmental allergies. So I, uh, it's my 24 seven job. I live this uh, every day of my life. Okay, so now I'm trying to see if I can, there we go. So a couple things we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about food allergy prevalence and some of our research around the rise we're seeing there. Um, we're going to talk about types of food reactions and food exacerbated eczema and diagnosis of food allergy, which is very related to eczema, which I'll talk about along with the early introduction of peanut products. So. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit because this data is fresh off the press. This uh, data was just released uh, about a week ago on the new prevalence numbers for uh, food allergy in children. And so what we find 
uh, is that 8% of children have a convincing food allergy, with 42% reporting a severe reaction, and 40% saying they're allergic to multiple foods. Now, this is strongly related to eczema because eczema is the number one risk factor for food allergies uh, in the US. So basically, as an infant, if you have eczema, then that puts you at high risk for developing food allergies. And I'll talk a lot more about that um, as we continue. So this survey we did, uh, we surveyed over 40,000 households across the United States from 2015 October to September of 2016. I'm not going to get into the sampling, but this is really what I want to show you. So overall, you know, I said 8%, it was 7.6% to be exact, but these are the order of foods. So it starts with peanut, and then quickly behind that is milk, shellfish, tree nut, egg, fin fish, wheat, soy, and sesame. And these nine foods make up over 90% of food allergies, although you can be allergic to pretty much anything. But these are the top, the most common. And what you'll see is many people don't actually get a proper physician diagnosis of their food allergy. They have a reaction and then they avoid the food and then they never go in to get a formal diagnosis. So you can see of the 7.6% that had a convincing food allergy, 4.7% of those had a true, like full physician diagnosis of their food allergy. So there are about, you know, two to three percent of kids out there who may have a true food allergy but are not getting that diagnosis. When we think about severity of food allergies, I think this is really important because often we talk about the peanut, but what's so important to note is that any food can cause a severe allergic reaction. And this is what people told us. Peanut, of course, almost 59% had already experienced a severe reaction, but you can see with any type of food, um, even egg and milk, a lot of kids are experiencing severe allergic reactions. And now when we talk about how often are they having reactions, we don't really know that number, but what we do know is that almost one in five kids with a food allergy are seen in the emergency room or are going to the emergency room for an allergic reaction every year. So 20%, approximately one in five, that's a lot of kids. Um, and 42% said they had been to the emergency department in their lifetime for a food allergic reaction. So, you know, almost half of these kids are having at least one emergency department visit for an allergic reaction but one in five are having it every year. Now, I, uh, we also have some brand new adult data, which I do want to tell you, um, as I'm sure there's many adults in the audience who are experiencing their own food allergies. So, you know, adults are a little bit different from kids. They still have high, high rates of food allergies. Um, almost one in 10 adults report having a convincing food allergy. The top one for adults is shellfish. Shellfish topped all the foods. Then that's followed by nuts. And then those same nine that you saw in kids are the same nine in adults. Now what's interesting about adults is more adults think they have a food allergy, and yet they may have another food-related condition. So that's something I wanna talk about to help you decipher what's going on in your body when you may eat a food and how that also relates to the eczema you're experiencing and potential flare-ups or, or when it gets better. Um, so let's go over uh, a couple of the theories behind this rise in food allergy. One of my close colleagues in Australia, Katie Allen, she likes thinking of it as the five Ds. So these are five hypotheses that we are currently um, looking at as being a reason for this increase that we've been seeing. So first is dry skin. So this is eczema. So number one, as I said before, number one risk factor for moving forward with all these atopic conditions, especially food allergy, is the presence of eczema. So eczema, dry skin, and then the diet. There's the vitamin D hypothesis. You know, are we getting too little vitamin D and is this causing us to experience higher rates of these atopic conditions. 
and then dogs and dribble. So this goes along with the microbiome or the hygiene hypothesis. You know, there are some studies showing more dogs in the house may cause less asthma. Now that hasn't been done in food allergies yet. However, the idea of mixing microbiome and getting that bacteria that may not be harmful for you, but having your system be aware of it, uh, may be protective. So dogs and dribble. And this also leads to the fact that um, we have smaller households and less children, um, and we're, we become very clean using antibacterial cleansers and products. And so we may not be exposing ourselves to the good bacteria um, that we often talk about these days as getting dirty or, or playing in the dirt. Now this is a really important slide I want to bring to your attention. It's a little complicated, so I'll walk you through it. But um, this is uh, the dual allergen hypothesis, and often um, refer referred to as the LAC hypothesis. Gideon LAC, who is uh, a researcher in um, London, actually really believes in this and, and strongly um, uses it to explain how eczema is such a such a large indicator of the development of uh, food allergies and potentially other food-related conditions. So if you look here, you can see the cutaneous exposure. So this is, as an infant, if you're exposed to some of the top allergens, for example, peanut dust, you know, milk protein, um, egg protein, so it has to be the protein, right? Because our bodies are reacting to the protein in these foods. So if your skin is exposed to this protein, then it may skew your immune system to the Th2 memory cells and cause allergies, so food allergies. However, if you were at first exposed orally, so through the gut, eat it and then get it into your gut, then it goes through your GI tract first, then it may actually take your immune system the right way to the Th1 pathway and you'll be fine you'll be tolerant. So this is one hypothesis for why is eczema so, so, so important in determining whether we develop food allergies later in life. Because his hypothesis or this hypothesis is saying if you're exposed first through the skin, it skews your pathway to develop allergies. So, and that means broken skin. So not just intact skin, but broken eczematous skin. That's when it can get in and expose you um, to those proteins in the wrong way that would actually skew your immune system to the development of allergies. I know this is confusing and it's hard because I can't take questions periodically from you, but I hope this makes a little bit of sense of the incredibly um, tight connection between eczema and food allergy. Okay, now I just want to take you through some um, food allergy symptoms because what we saw on the adult survey and on the pediatric survey where many people were having reactions to foods but it was difficult for them to understand what that reaction meant. So what are some common food allergy symptoms? So the problem with food allergy is that it can actually impact any organ system of your body. So this makes it really complicated uh, when you're having a reaction or trying to recognize a reaction. So let's talk about a couple of the systems. So it can affect your respiratory system. You can get wheezing, trouble breathing, coughing, a little bit with the wheezing and trouble breathing. Definitely affects your GI system. Vomiting and stomach pain are very, very common. Skin, you know, we always talk about hives, right? And so developing hives, um, rashes or worsening of the eczema. A lot of people talk about swelling, itching, can affect your cardiovascular system. So you can have this immediate drop in blood pressure or fainting. Uh, and then a lot of oral symptoms people get. So feeling like your throat is closing, um, tingling, itching, swelling in the mouth. Now, sometimes you may only have one system when you eat a certain food, and this may actually be something that's not an IgE-mediated food allergy. So for example, what we're gonna go into is if you only have GI symptoms, um, so only stomach pains, cramping, potential vomiting, you may consider another diagnosis. It could be an intolerance, FPIs, celiac, gluten sensitivity. So just putting those in your mind 
um, so that you get the best diagnosis and you know exactly what's going on in your body. Um, if you only have oral symptoms, so every time you eat the food, you only get a little tingling on your lips or, or um, a little swelling around your mouth, then that may actually be something else too, oral allergy sy syndrome. And the reason it's so important to know what your symptoms are and what's happening is because they're all a little different and they can be treated differently and different ones can cause different levels of severity. So it is really, really critical. Um, so, so important, I can't emphasize it enough to understand your symptoms and see a physician, see an allergist who can really, really help you determine exactly what's going on when you eat a food. Now, I really like this. This was a poster made by uh, Allergy and Asthma Network, which kind of takes you through what we talked about. So you can see you can have these the mouth, the itching, swelling. We talked about the throat, tightness, uh, cardiovascular, um, dizziness, passing out because of a drop in blood pressure. Uh, lungs, you can have the shortness of breath, skin, itching, hives, stomach, we talked about vomiting, um, diarrhea, cramps. And then others people often talk about is this feeling of impending doom. Um, and you can get, you know, flushed. There's a lot of other things people describe, but I just want to take you through some of the most common. Now, for a food allergy, it's so, so important to recognize your symptoms because you can deteriorate pretty rapidly. And so, it's really important if you feel um, severe symptoms coming on that you alert someone, call 911, take your epinephrine auto injector, and um, seek medical help. So this is really, really critical if it is a true food allergy, and that's why I think it's so important to get that proper diagnosis. So what are these other types of food uh, reactions. So the IgE mediated food reactions, that's what I was talking about with the food allergies. Then there's food intolerances, non-IgE cell mediated food allergy, and mixed IgE mediated. Now you don't have to remember all of this. This isn't, you know, things that you need to go to your doctor and, and say, hey, I think it's a, this type. Let's just go through um, a little bit about the, the different reactions you can have. Now, you can have food exacerbated eczema, and I'm sure this is something many of you may wonder about, um, because you eat a food and you feel that your eczema flares up and gets significantly worse. So ingestion of a specific food can acutely cause flares to your eczema, and this is a real thing. And the flare can occur within minutes, a few hours, or days. And it's usually just limited to the fact that that eczema is getting worse on your skin. So it may not be an actual IgE-mediated food allergy, but it also may. So that's why it's important if you eat that food to really listen to your body and understand what's going on. And is it just my eczema is getting worse or are there other things happening at the same time? And then talk to your doctor about that and then get the right testing. Now, past studies have found that food can be the cause for this eczema in up to 33% of patients with severe eczema, 10 to 20 with moderate eczema, and only 6% with mild eczema. So it is unlikely that food is a trigger if a child's eczema improves while eating an unrestricted diet. It's important to see an allergy specialist, we talked about that, to evaluate a possible food trigger, and we should avoid unnecessary limitations in a child's diet. So now let's get into uh, a couple other types of food-related reactions. Now, this is a really, really important one, oral allergy syndrome. It is one uh, that we have learned more and more about just recently. Uh, it is often overlooked. Um, many people who have oral allergy syndrome think they may have a life-threatening food allergy. So that's why, just so that you can decrease the stress and anxiety um, to get a proper diagnosis if this is what you really feel your symptoms are. So this is also known as pollen food allergy, and it's actually caused by the cross-reaction of food and pollen allergens in patients that are allergic to pollen. So if you have um, you know, seasonal allergies and, and pollen is one of them, you could potentially have these symptoms. So it's usually limited to the mouth, so oropharyngeal pruritus, so itchiness or tingling of your mouth or your palate, usually goes away in minutes after the food is swallowed or removed from the mouth. And OAS is typically presents in older children, teens, and young adults. 
Um, most people actually who are affected by OAS can eat cooked fruits or vegetables, just not the raw ones. So not every individual who's allergic to pollen develops symptoms with the cross-reacting of fruits and vegetables. Uh, you may react to a few, but not all of the foods. Here's a couple common examples. So if you're allergic to birch, often you could have reactions to apples, carrots, peaches, plums, cherries, pears, almonds, and hazelnut. Uh, grasses, you can have allergies, these same symptoms, to tomatoes. Ragweed, you could have it to melon, zucchini, cucumber, kiwi, banana. Now, there's so many foods that can cause these symptoms. So really important, again, if it's only oral, make sure you get a diagnosis and make sure, is it OAS or is it a true food allergy? I'm going to hit on food intolerances for just a bit. I know I don't have a ton of time, but um, all of these topics could take their own couple seminars. So we're, we're just looking at the surface to help you better understand um, what happens when you eat the food. But uh, we can go into a lot more detail, and I encourage you to do that with your physician. So food intolerances do not involve the immune system. Although food intolerances may cause some of the same symptoms as a true food allergy, they cannot trigger anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is this um, very severe reaction that happens immediately and can get um, can be life-threatening. So uh, intolerance does not trigger this whole anaphylaxis cascade. The most common symptoms in a food intolerance are GI related. So one of the most common intolerances that you probably all know very, very much about is lactose intolerance. This is super common in our society. Uh, and it's actually what that means is it's a deficiency in the lactase enzyme. So lactase is what breaks down lactose, which is a sugar that's found in milk and dairy products. So when you drink the milk, if you don't have this enzyme, um, the lactose isn't broken down, and then you get that bloating, um, cramping, irritation, uh, and then can also have some diarrhea and sometimes even vomiting. Usually that's where your symptoms stop. If you have more than that, then again, you need to talk to your doctor. Um, affected individuals are not able to digest and absorb lactose. I talked about the symptoms, and it usually occurs within 30 minutes to two hours after having a milk product. Now, there is milk allergy, so this is where it gets fuzzy, right? So you really need to know if you have lactose intolerance or a true milk allergy, because a true milk allergy can cause all those other symptoms we talked about and can be life-threatening. Okay, let's talk really briefly about gluten sensitivity, which is, again, another common condition. Gluten is found in wheat, rye, barley, and sometimes oats. Uh, Non-celiac gluten sensitivity describes a syndrome of GI symptoms in response to gluten ingestion. So you can get abdominal pain, again, bloating, changes in bowel patterns, hours to days after eating gluten. Patients will have no evidence of celiac when they're tested and when they get their laboratory testing done or have a biopsy oftentimes, and they improve on a gluten-free diet. And it's likely due to the inability to absorb fermentable short-chain carbohydrates, which are more common in foods with gluten. So this is a condition It's again, different from wheat allergy, which is a true food allergy where you can get all those other symptoms. So if you eat gluten and only have GI, then you need to look into three different things that it could be, right? Um, is it this gluten sensitivity? Could you have celiac? Or is it a true uh, wheat food allergy? Okay, so that leads us right to celiac. So now celiac is a chronic inflammation of the small bowel, an adverse reaction to the protein in gluten. Symptoms include the bloating, gas, chronic diarrhea, abdominal pain, headaches, itchy skin rash, and malnourishment. So a lot of these kids don't grow, and that's when they really discover it because they're having abdominal pain, stomach aches, and then they're not growing. Um, so it actually results in the destruction of the small intestine, and that's what they'll see when they do that biopsy. Again, different from gluten sensitivity and different from a wheat 
food allergy. When people with this digestive disease eat gluten, they experience an immune reaction in the small intestine. IgE, the antibody responsible for life-threatening reactions, anaphylaxis, does not play a role in this disorder. However, the immune system uh, response in celiac disease may damage the lining of the small intestine. And this will cause you not to be able to properly absorb nutrients in food. And over time, that's what leads to that malnourishment and decreased growth, weight gain. Okay, a couple others for you. So food protein induced allergic proctocolitis. All right, so this is usually in infants, um, young infants, when they drink milk products, they can get blood and mucus in the stool. Um, it's normal uh, and happens frequently in infants, usually to cow's milk, soy, and egg are the most common triggers. Uh, usually this resolves, see if I have it now. So usually this resolves um, after a year of life. So this isn't something that typically goes on. They're not going to continue to have this and they will be able to have milk products later in life. But again, should be closely followed and this usually by your pediatrician. Now f is another um, different uh, a condition. It's called food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome and we're learning more and more about this every day. Uh, so it is, for short FPIs, it's a non-IgE cell mediated food allergy that can be severe in infants and lead to shock. And when I say infants, we usually discover it in infants. However, it can occur, we're starting to see even in adults. Awareness of FPIs is low. Um, just new um, condition that we're learning more, not new, but something that we have now uh, learned a lot more about and developed some guidelines for. So it's, it's just starting to get out there um, in the public in, in terms of a, a diagnosis. Uh, unlike typical food allergy, symptoms may not be immediate and they don't show up uh, on allergy, standard allergy tests. And understanding the pathophysiology diagnosis and management um, are lacking, even though it's getting better rapidly. There's some amazing researchers working very hard on this. Uh, and clinical outcomes are poorly established. What are the symptoms in FPIs? It's so usually, again, GI uh, can manifest as profuse repetitive vomiting and lethargy, typically occurring two to four hours following the ingestion of the allergen. Uh, then it can be followed by diarrhea. Um, can also get dehydration, lethargy, like we talked about, pallor, uh, cyanosis, which means kind of turning blue and, and weakness, hypotension, uh, change in your blood pressure, and even shock-like symptoms. And then chronic exposure to that food item could cause intermittent vomiting, diarrhea with blood mucus, or both failure to thrive, and low levels of albumin in the blood. And what are common triggers for FPIs? The most common triggers are cow's milk, soy, and rice and oats. Others common triggers um, that have been reported are eggs, poultry, beans, vegetables, and seafood. And we're currently trying to understand how much FPIs exists in children and adults in the U.S. Okay, um, being conscious of time, I'm going to get to a couple others. Um, eosinophilic esophagitis. Now, this is a chronic immune mediated esophageal disease characterized by esophageal dysfunction and inflammation. So, EOE, for short, is a histologic diagnosis. You have to do a biopsy to determine it, and you see high numbers of eosinophils seen in your esophagus. Uh, usually, the symptoms you're he you'll hear about in EOE are feeding difficulties, difficulty swallowing, feeling like something is stuck in your throat, um, reflux, vomiting, and sometimes abdominal pain. Symptoms of older children is food impaction, like we were talking about in dysphagia. Uh, patients with EOE typically have other atopic conditions, so typically they do start with eczema, and many times they also have been diagnosed with food allergies and then they start having these localized symptoms and then we realize maybe this is EOE. A lot of times these kids aren't growing 
too. They have malnourishment and decreased uh, weight. Weight. Then there's eosinophilic gastroenteritis. And this is diagnosed when eosinophils are found distal to the esophagus in the stomach. The pathophysiology of EOE and EG are largely unknown, but likely to be multifactorial with both a genetic and environmental component. Okay, I'm gonna get into diagnosis. Let's talk about, now what do you do? I've given you all of these, hopefully not completely confused you, but you need to go to your physician with those symptoms that you're having when you eat a specific food. Um, typically, this is your allergist that you would uh, get this diagnosis from. So if you're seeing your dermatologist or your primary care provider, ask to see an allergist, but definitely discuss it with them as well. Now, what are the tests that they do? So this is an important point. It is important if you don't know what food it is, don't just get a panel test of IgEs. Um, now, IgE is specific to a food. So if you do, if you ate a peanut and you um, had an immediate reaction and then you go to the doctor and you tell them about it and they do a specific IgE to peanut and it's high, that is a way we often do make that diagnosis. The problem is if you don't know what you ate and you just got an IgE to peanut and it was positive, then the positive predictive value of this test is very low. So you don't know if you really have it. You may have a 50-50 chance of having that peanut allergy or just being sensitized. So having the IgE in your blood, but you may be able to eat it just fine. So this is the biggest problem with just getting blanket tests because if they're positive and you remove those foods from your diet, you may be hurting your own lifestyle and nutrition potentially by removing them without actually uh, knowing that that is the food that you're allergic to. Unfortunately, the only gold standard test we have is a oral food challenge, which means you go to your allergist and they feed you or you eat small amounts of that food that you think you're allergic to over time and see if you have a reaction. But this is the only true way of knowing if it is a true food allergy. The other way of diagnosing it, like I said, is when you eat a food that you are sure of and you have a reaction to it, and then you go to your allergist, they may do a specific IgE to that food, or they may do a skin prick test to that food. And if those are positive, then it's diagnosed as a food allergy. And here are those tests that I was talking about, the skin prick test, the serum specific IgE, and the oral food challenge. Now this is again, I already went through this, so I won't repeat it, but um, the specific IG, the blood test, uh, don't ever get a panel and only test the foods that you think are the culprits. Allergen skin test, um, this is where you can measure the wheel uh, and see if it is positive depending on the size of the wheel. And this is again done by your allergist. And then the oral food challenge, which I talked about where um, you actually eat the food under the supervision of your allergist and see if you have a reaction. Okay, last but definitely not least, I really want to talk about the early introduction of peanut um, because these are guidelines that have recently been changed and it's really important to note. So uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2000 when food allergy was on the rise said, avoid peanut products until you're at least three years old. Now, in 2008, they, were, they changed this because there were no data coming out saying that eating foods early before three years, like peanut products, um, increase your risk of developing a peanut allergy. So they said, do whatever you want. We don't know, there's no data, so do whatever fits your life. In 2015, the LEAP study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that early introduction, especially in high-risk infants, and by high risk, the biggest risk factor was eczema. Um, high-risk infants, uh, if they introduce peanut products into their diets early, so they did it between 4 and 11 months, they had an 80% reduction in developing peanut allergy. That's huge. Preventing peanut allergy in an infant 
through their lives is um, such a huge reward. So this is where um, the guidelines completely changed and now it is encouraged for all infants to start peanut products uh, and for high risk infants to get tested and then start. And I'll show you this in a minute, I'm going through these slides slightly fast, but this is how it all started was when these researchers, um, George Dutois and Gideon Lack in London and their colleagues, they found that uh, UK Jewish children versus Israeli Jewish children had significantly different rates of peanut allergy. And they uh, related this to the fact that infants in Israel eat Bamba, a peanut product, as infants. So they thought, well, maybe there's something protective about introducing it into the diet at that early uh, time period when the immune system is developing. So that is their conclusion. Early consumption of peanuts in infancy is associated with a low prevalence of peanut allergy. Now, this is the paper I discussed earlier, the LEAP study, which found in these high-risk infants, so infants with eczema or egg allergy, those were the two factors they found to be high risk. Uh, it significantly decreased their development of peanut allergy. These are the addendum guidelines that I was fortunate to be a part of. And these are the guidelines that were expressed. So basically high risk, severe eczema, egg allergy, or both, uh, they need to get tested. So an IgE specific to peanut or a skin prick test. And if those are positive, then you need to discuss the results with an allergist to determine next steps. If they're negative, they need to introduce peanut products into that infant's diet as soon as possible, as early as four months. But you need to talk to your pediatrician and your allergist again. Now, if it's mild to moderate eczema or no eczema, then it's encouraged that when the child is ready, they should be introduced to peanut products, preferably around six months of age. We talked about egg allergy. Now, many infants at that age will probably not have had eggs, so would not have been diagnosed with an egg allergy. However, if they are, it is a significant risk factor. Eczema, again, persistent or frequent reoccurring eczema, typical morphology and distribution, assessed as severe by a healthcare provider and requiring prescription strength topical corticosteroids, calcineurin inhibitors, or other anti-inflammatory agents despite appropriate use of emollients. That's how it's defined, severe eczema, in the guidelines. Again, getting that specific IgE to peanut, and if it's negative, introduce. If it's positive, need to see an allergist to discuss, because the allergist will probably do a skin prick test, and depending on the results of the skin prick test, will decide whether to introduce peanut products to you in the office or to your infant. Now there's some great counseling materials for people at low risk um, or people at high risk who are encouraged to start peanut products in their diet. Um, this is a form that we put together, which I'm happy to share and put on the website. It talks about introduction of solid foods in general, but then how do you start peanut proteins in your infant? So these are a couple recipes and then what to look out for in terms of symptoms of an allergic reaction. Again, some symptom, some instructions uh, when you are feeding that infant. Uh, make sure you have at least a two hour block of time and you're able to observe the infant. Um, prepare the peanut product mix. Never hold peanuts ever. Uh, that's a choking hazard. Uh, give a little bit, um, wait 10 minutes. If no allergic reaction, then continue to feed. And then be very mindful of any allergic reaction. And if anything were to occur, then take the appropriate steps, uh, getting medical help. Again, for recipes uh, that provide those two grams of peanut protein into an infant's diet, which is encouraged two grams of protein um, about every other day or two to three times a week. Okay, uh, I think I've been through all this and with that, uh, I will end. I know I've taken up most of my time, but um, I hope that was helpful and beneficial. We went through a lot of material, but uh, eczema and food uh, conditions are very closely related. 
and so many um, patients, uh, families I talk to uh, have both. It's all part of the same atopic spectrum. So um, really deciphering them and knowing exactly what you have is really uh, critical to being able to manage it in the best way possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was an outstanding presentation, so informative. I know that we get a lot of questions about food in so many ways all the time. Um, and this will definitely help inform a lot of that as we continue on. Um, so now we move on to some questions. We did actually receive quite a few questions already. Um, and for those watching live, please feel free to submit uh, questions along the way that we will try to answer in um, future follow-up information. So um, I'm just going to go down the list. <laughs> um, so you did address some of this. This person has said that food allergies seemingly cause their eczema to flare. You did say that mm -hmm. that can happen, whether it's an allergy or sensitivity or an intolerance, that yes, yeah. yeah, sometimes that happens. It can, but the important thing there is is definitely see your physician and talk about it. Is it is it really a food allergy then, or is it that food is causing the flare? You know, right. and that's all it's ever going to do because it makes a big difference in your lifestyle. You know, do you have to worry and carry epinephrine around um, because you could have a life threatening reaction, or I mean, either way, you should remove the food from your diet. But it would be nice to know if it's life threatening in nature. Mm hmm. So assuming it it's a true food allergy, um, they're asking if there's anything that can be done to improve it. But if they're eating it enough to make it flare, odds are it's not an allergy. True. <laughs> right. You're right. No, that's exactly right. So you should be avoiding it completely if it's a true food allergy, because it can cause severe reactions. Um, however, if it's in your diet, that's a really good question. Um, can you do something so you can keep it in your diet and reduce the flares, right? That is a, a great question. And I would really refer you to your dermatologist um, because there uh, may be ways to do it. I mean, things that we talk about oftentimes are taking an antihistamine. You know, will it decrease the histamine release and uh, decrease your symptoms? But again, I would encourage you to, to discuss that with your dermatologist. Great. Um, so here's someone who has been looking at how they can use their food um, to improve their skin. Uh, they said that over a year ago, they started eating, eating vegan and gluten-free and, of course, have never felt better. Okay. Great. High energy, their skin healed, only an itch here or there. Has there been any research that supports these results? If so, what has been found? And if not, why not? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to do because it's very individualized. You know, some people will take certain foods out of their diet, they'll feel healthier. And so that's that gluten sensitivity we talked about. We often see this and hear those stories um, with gluten, but other foods, you know, who takes what out and what is it? Is it a sensitivity that's happening um, that's specific for them or is it something that's more generalizable? So gluten has been found to be one that many people seem to benefit from when they take it out of their diet, but others don't, you know? So there are there is research happening to try to understand what food groups this happens most frequently with and what to test or how to know that that is what you may have. Um, I think a lot of the research around food conditions uh, is pretty new. I mean, even food allergies. When I started in this area 14 years ago, very little was um, known, and now we know so much, and there's treatments on the way. So um, so it's moved rapidly. So I'm hoping in the next five to 10 years, with all these recent um, food condition developments, you know, we will have a lot more data that we can share. But it's great. If you have been able to pinpoint what you need to take out of your diet to make you feel better, then that's, you know, nothing better. So basically, if it makes you feel better, enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, um, well, that kind of leads me, I'll, I'm going to jump around a little here. Um, you know, because people do ask all the time, they ask about specific foods. And as you said, it's very individual. Um, but of course, one of the big buzzwords in all your world, our world, all of them is inflammation. And yeah. 
anti-inflammatory diet is very on trend right now. So um, is can you talk a little bit? Could it could it be that? Is it that, oh, this person experienced a decreased inflammation and that's why? Or because, um, you know, you hear a lot about other than gluten, sugar or dairy yeah. um, yep. you know, foods that are typically associated with inflammation. Right. Right. And, you know, inflammation means so much, right? It's so hard. We just we usually package these terms and then we say, oh, maybe it's causing this in my body or, you know, like we talk all about the microbiome, about inflammation, about hygiene, right? Like, so there's, there are these keywords. I, I 100% agree. Um, those inflammatory markers may change and different foods may cause uh, different amounts of inflammation. And again, this is where I feel like we are moving so much more towards personalized medicine because each of us is so unique and depending on your genetic makeup plus your specific environmental conditions may cause um, certain triggers to happen in your body from certain foods or certain conditions. So um, this is where, yes, an anti-inflammatory diet is really hot right now, but talking to your doctor about what that means for you. And I know I keep going back to this, but I, I you know, from the studies we've done, there's so many people who don't go and have that conversation with their doctor to really understand what it is about them specifically. And, you know, you find all these things on the web, which is great. And I do think it's a starting point, but then your finish line point is sitting down with your doctor and figuring out how those things fit into your lifestyle with your genetic makeup and your environmental triggers. I know uh, I've, hear, I've heard frequently um, that one of the frustrations, particularly in the eczema community is and this is, you know, is not always true and certainly not with the people we work with, but um, that often they'll come in with the concept of uh, diet impacting their eczema and feel like their practitioners dismiss them mm. um, yeah. because it's not a true food allergy. And that's fair, but you've addressed how that it, that's not the whole story. So yeah. as a provider, do you have any advice you can give to this group for how they can approach it where it doesn't sound like they're just coming in and saying, well, Dr. Google told me yeah. that I should do this diet. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's really important. And I hear that a lot too. Um, I think because food has become such a popular, um, all this, there's so much out there on foods and how it can impact you. Maybe some physicians do dismiss it as you're fine. You're not don't have a life-threatening food allergy, don't worry about it. Um, but I think what you should ask for is you have to go to the right doctor, right? So um, I would suggest, even if it's not a food allergy, say, well, there's, you know, 10 other food-related conditions out there, and I just really like to understand what I have. And this may not be your primary doctor who's doing this. You may still need to go to an allergist, you know? So because the allergist, that's their special, they specialize in food conditions. Yeah, food allergy, but all food conditions, and they can help break that apart for you. Um, so often, you know, primary care doctors are not necessarily versed, nor do they have the time to sit down and really figure it out. Some do who are amazing, but I would really recommend you ask for, you know, can I see an allergist or, or go see an allergist and say, you know, these are the symptoms I have. I realize this may not be a food allergy, but I do want to know how to manage it better. Um, so, and they should sit down. And if you don't find the right one, you you go to another one, you know, like there will be someone out there who um, can sit down with you and help you kind of sort through them. Like even when I was making this talk, I mean, there are, I didn't even hit all of them. You know, there's just so many things that can happen to your body when you eat a food and, and we're starting to put names on them and know how to manage them. But a lot of them, we don't even understand like f -pies. but we're seeing adults having it. And then how do they get a diagnosis? properly when, you know, even the medical community is still trying to figure it out, you know, so it is important to keep going, you know, and, and try to figure out exactly to the closest amount you can, what you have and what you have to do to manage it properly. That's great advice. And certainly for those watching, um, <clears throat> we have our eczema provider finder and we, oh yeah, we've got our allergists on there. So Excellent. If the allergists yeah. are watching, make sure you get on there if this is an area of interest for you, because our people need you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's a great resource. 
here is an interesting question. Uh, are there any foods that can help skin heal and or improve? Wow, that's a great question. Um, and again, it varies so much based on who you are. Um, I have heard of foods, uh, you know, a lot of people take probiotic type of things, right? So, and those are all not necessarily foods, but they're, you know, good bacteria in, um, that originally came from a food substance. So um, there are a lot of um, natural remedies out there. Uh, the hardest thing for me is uh, many of them are untested. So it's hard to recommend things without having the data or the research behind it. But there are a lot of products that are, are being marketed out there that, that are safe to use. I just uh, don't know of natural products with good research data uh, mm -hmm. supporting it personally. Others may, which I would love for everyone to share because I would love to learn uh, from all of you, you know, what you think are great remedies. We're always looking uh, to make things more natural and easier on the body and the skin. Great. Definitely. I'm um, not doing Stop answering these questions. No, I'm so I sorry. That, All of you. <laughs> I wish I had the answers. I'm working on it. Right. When we find that miracle cure, we'll let everybody know. We promise. Yeah, I promise. <laughs> um, does eating something that you're allergic to affect your body in the same way as if the item is in your skincare or cosmetics? Oh, that's a good question. Um, eating something uh, will affect you the most unless you have um, broken skin. So this is where eczema comes into play. If you have eczema to skin and if you have lesions or broken skin, then it could be very um, somewhat dangerous to apply products onto that skin that uh, have food products in it or food protein in it. So um, this is where we get nervous, right? So same with that hypothesis that I talked about earlier. If food protein enters through eczematous skin prior to entering the gut, there is a chance it could skew your immune system to developing food allergy. And so that is, that's one of the challenges we face um, with infants is what are we putting on their skin and what are we putting on their eczematous skin? One of the biggest pieces of advice I can give you is work hard with your dermatologist to um, improve your eczema so that you have a clean, good skin barrier. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that is really critical. We're learning in infants, that's really critical to protect the skin barrier in those early years um, when their immune system is developing to protect them from developing the other atopic conditions that come after. So um, as much as you can get proper treatment. Um, and now I know it's, it's very, very hard and eczema is a, a very difficult condition to keep under control all the time, but with all the new uh, treatments, and this is where your dermatologist will come in much handier than me, um, as much as you can, stay with the regimens and, and keep it under control, and especially in your infants. Definitely. Well, I'm gonna wind us down with one final question here. Um, <clears throat> this is an interesting one. This couple is actually in Italy, and their allergist says no, but is it possible that you can be allergic to sugar? Wow. Okay, I would. I need to know so much more. <laughs> from them. Um, well, I have a little more he, They say he starts scratching and bursts into flames shortly after eating or drinking something containing sugar. So is this an allergy or an indicator that something else in his body has an issue with sugar? Yeah, I mean, if it's scratching and itching and redness, if it's all skin related, uh, it may be something else. Um, but he needs to get proper testing and and treatment. Um, you could have an allergy to sugar; it's very uncommon. So I would probably say it's something else, especially if he has no other symptoms, no vomiting, um, no, uh, you know respiratory symptoms, trouble breathing, which is a good thing if it's not an allergy. Um, but what is it? So is it something to do with the breakdown of the sugar? Is it something to do with the type? Like these are all questions that they really need to go see 
uh, an expert for. And if their um, physician is not helping them, then they need to to find someone else. And I do know some amazing doctors in Italy, so I'm happy to <laughs> add, uh, give some names of people I know that are really cutting edge there. Great. Well, if they reach out again, we will definitely uh, let you know. know. (laughs) That would be great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much again. Let's uh, go ahead and call it a day for our presentation now. Um, Thank you again to our sponsor, Sanofi Genzyme Regeneron, for their support of the Webinar Wednesday series. Um, Don't forget to get involved with NIA. You can become an ambassador and share your eczema journey in writing or in person. You can work in grassroots advocacy, join our online support group through Inspire, and more. You can attend our Eczema Expo in Scottsdale this summer, July 2019. Um, And of course, you can always donate as a 501c3 nonprofit. Our work relies on the support of our community. So thank you again, Dr. Gupta. What a phenomenal presentation. And I know it will be so helpful for people to truly understand what that difference is between a true allergy, a sensitivity, and all the many other myriad ways that food can impact you and your eczema. Um, You can find more resources on our website at nationaleczema.org, including a similarly framed um, article that you can read on this topic. And um, on behalf of National Eczema, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you. Have a wonderful